time to pull up a chair and talk some Dynasty football. I am your host, J.J. Wenner. I'm Don Detweiler. I'm Rob Mongol. I'm Kid Vidalich. And this is the Rider Dynasty podcast. Tonight on the show, we are continuing with our Ride or Die players. These are the players in each round per sleeper ADP about whom we have the most confidence. We will also have a lightning round of the players in the top eight that we have the least confidence in. But before we get to tonight's show, do me a favor. Give us a follow on Twitter, at Rider Dynasty, and check out our website, RideOrDynasty.com, for all of our latest articles. Now, on last week's podcast, we went through the first four rounds of Sleeper's Dynasty Superflex ADP. Thank you to Sleeper for sharing that. If you missed last week's podcast, I suggest listening to get our picks for the top four rounds. Tonight, what we are going to do is pick up where we left off and jump right into round five. We will each pick one player from the round of ADP who we are the most confident in for this season. A player that will help lead you to a championship. One player who is our ride or die for the season. Let's get right back into round five. According to Sleeper, here is the order. Pick 49 is Aaron Rodgers, followed by David Montgomery, Allen Robinson, Chris Godwin, Deshaun Watson. DJ Moore comes in at 54, followed by Mark Andrews, Keenan Allen, Javante Williams, TJ Hawkinson, Amari Cooper, and Matthew Stafford. Kit, out of those 12, who is your ride or die player? Uh, Chris Godwin for round five. Uh, so he's 25 years old. He's a good combination of youth and a proven production. Uh, you know, he did get banged up a little bit last year, but he was 13, uh, 13th in points per game in terms of half PPR. Um, there is some contract uncertainty, right? But I expect if he did move elsewhere, it would be on a large contract to basically be a you know, target dominator. I look back at this time last year, he was the wide receiver, dynasty wide receiver four. Uh, now he's going around 14. Don't really see a reason for that fall. Uh, I know people have talked about there's, potentially an uncertain QB future because Brady is ancient, but uh, not any more than I think a lot of other you know receivers going ahead of him are in his range. You know, Galladay has Daniel Jones, which we don't know. Allen Robinson has a rookie QB. Uke has a rookie QB. So it feels like the, that and the contract uncertainty are kind of what's pushing him down, and I don't think for any good reason. So he's who I'm snagging here. Yeah, it's a mysterious why Godwin suddenly has fallen out of favor. He's still young and he's still talented. I love Chris Godwin. Rob, who is your ride or die player? I almost went with Chris Godwin, and I'm glad Kid is talking about him here because I'm a I'm a giant Chris Godwin fan. But I'm here tonight to talk about David Montgomery. I don't get the hate. The entire offseason narrative is he can't finish as the RB four again. Fade him. David Montgomery will never repeat. And look, I agree. He's not going to finish as the RB four again. We've got a healthy Saquon and Christian McCaffrey coming into the season. But you're not drafting him as the RB4. He's coming off the board as RB21 under current ADP, and he's going to smash that. That's crazy. It It's absolutely crazy. And the guy's only 24 years old. He's coming into his third season. So you're getting someone who I firmly believe will be a high-end RB2, low-end RB1 this year, who's still very young at a, at a significant discount, in my opinion. Last year, he put up 1,070 yards and eight touchdowns. And he had 68 targets and 54 receptions for another 438 yards in the air. He had the third most broken tackles behind Derrick Henry and Dalvin Cook. He had the third highest juke rate behind Antonio Gibson and a, a sneaky surprise for you guys later. And I have him as my RB16 in redraft. I'm, I'm firmly in on him. I think he's going way too late. I'm expecting the targets to decrease a little bit, but I think... This season, he's going to outproduce a lot of names going a few rounds ahead of him. I think he's going to. I think you'll be happier with him at the end of the season than Cam Akers, than Antonio Gibson, than Clyde edwards hilaire All these guys coming off, coming into year two with a lot of hype, and I think he's going to be better than Najee. He's also going ahead of him, and they're all relatively similar ages. David Montgomery's twenty four. Everyone I mentioned is either 22 or 23 and has you know, either, in, in Najee's case, no year's experience, but they've got similar wear and tear in their bodies from the NFL. Don, who is your ride or die? So here we go, ride or die. Uh, I'm going to take ADP 60, Matt Stafford. 
coming into a going to be pass happy offense that's actually going to be able to run the ball a little bit when they choose to. But here we finally have a big arm quarterback in offensive genius Sean McVay's pass happy attack here with guys that can trademark. Yeah, let's see. Well, it's mine, so I don't have to. Oh, that's true. That's true. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's cool. <laughs> so we've got a player added here in Tutu Atwell. It's going to be able to clear out the deep seam and down the field and then let those guys underneath feast. Fun to say Cooper Cup is going to be all over the place. Bobby Trees is going to just absolutely feed. This is going to be a fun offense to watch. And it's an offensive line that's capable of actually protecting him, which is something he's never seen before. So I feel like now is the opportunity for Matt Stafford. And going at the back of this uh, round five is awesome placement to get somebody who's going to produce at high volume. You know, I have Stafford in only one league. But I am excited to see what he does this year with McVeigh and just finally getting out of Detroit, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, my ride or die for this round is Keenan Allen, uh, the wide receiver 13 overall last year, despite missing two games. He was seventh in points per games um, over the past four years. He's averaged 147 targets, which was the number he had last year with Herbert. He is still the wide receiver one on the team. He's paired with a phenomenal young QB uh, in Justin Herbert. I don't see him slipping outside of getting it injured uh, for the next three to four years. So in the past four years, he has finished 13th, 6th, 12th, and 3rd. I'm going with Keenan Allen. And all day long, I would be happy to put him in as my wide receiver one on a team. So Keenan Allen is our my choice. Now, for the first time, we all chose somebody different in this round. So just to recap, Kit, you went with Chris Godwin. Rob, you went with David Montgomery. Don, you hit Matthew Stafford. And I had Keenan Allen. Now, in round six, let's go back to the sleeper ADP. We start out with the Dolphins QB, Tua Tagovailoa, followed by Mike Evans, T. Higgins, Chris Carson, Zach Wilson, Robs Bay, Ryan Tannehill, Brandon Ayuk, Baker Mayfield, Devonta Smith, Kareem Hunt, Jerry Judy, and Chase Claypool. Rob, who do you have in round six as your ride or die player? Oh, you already know who I'm going to pick, JJ. You already know. My round six pick is Ryan Tannehill. I don't understand the hate. I don't. I don't get it at all. He's got two elite weapons for the first time in his career. I don't think Ferkser is a massive downgrade from Johnny Smith. Maybe that's a slight on Johnny Smith, but I, I really don't see the difference between the two of them. He's only 32. He's under a long-term contract. He's got some rushing upside. And what people tend to neglect when looking at Tannehill is that he had one more top five finish last year than Patrick Mahomes then Deshaun Watson, and then Le and Lamar Jackson. They each had five. Ryan Tannehill finished in the top five of the quarterback position six times last year. He had one less 25-point game than Patrick Mahomes and Lamar Jackson. He's less than one point per game average behind Lamar. And he did that last year without Julio and with an injured A.J. Brown. And he averages just as many rushing touchdowns as Lamar Jackson. People forget that he is extremely athletic. He was a former wide receiver, converted to quarterback. And in round six, he's going 50 spots behind Russell Wilson. And I don't see the difference between the two of them. I think they're they're very similar players, and they're both 32 years old. Give me the guy who can get 50 spots later in the draft. You know what? I'm going to actually jump in order and follow you up, because I also went with Ryan Tannehill, Rob. Uh, last season, he never finished lower than a QB2. Like, that was his floor, was top 24. I'll take that. You know, if your strategy is to wait on QB, even in a super flex, this is a good place to start picking up, right? Get Ryan Tannehill as your QB1. And if you're lucky enough to have Tannehill as your QB2, you are golden, right? Like, you are set. I love Tannehill. I'm all on board, Rob. Don, who is your ride or die? Give me the uh, the phenom here, T. Higgins, coming in as, believe it or not, the wide receiver 19 with the dreck that he had at quarterback after poor Joe had his knees taken out from under him. Yeah, they add Jamar Chase at offense, and that's fine. 
Now, often defenses just can't lay on Higgins and absolutely focus on him. He's going to have an open side of the field to work with. They'll most likely split them to opposite sides, and defenses are going to have to pick their poison and who they want to deal with. Joe Burrow is a talented enough quarterback to be able to read the field. And Higgins just has a tremendous catch radius. He can attack down the field, but he's actually shown that he's enough of a route runner to be able to do some different things and not just be a go-ball guy. So... I love him in the red zone. I think he's going to be above the wide receiver 19 for sure. And I'll take him in this grouping. I like Higgins. I'm a fan of uh, Higgins completely. How do you, uh, if you were going to put targets in order between the wide receivers, um, Chase, Higgins, Boyd, who's getting the most targets do you think this year, Don? I think the most. Who's going to be the, the number one? I don't think there's going to be a clear cut, but I would say that Chase will be number one. But I don't see, like, a huge dynamic here. I don't see a gap of, like, 30 or anything. I think it's going to be relatively split because Burrow has shown everywhere that he's played football that he's willing to distribute the ball around. So defenses are going to have to decide what they want to do here. In some weeks, you're going to have Chase get a higher percentage, and in some weeks, you're going to see T. Higgins. And Higgins, being the taller, better red zone threat, I think he's going to have the more high-value targets. The red zone targets. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Kit, who do you uh, have for your ride or die? Unfortunately, this round's going to be a little bit boring because I had Ryan Tannehill as well. <laughs> Don't have too much to add, but that one stood out at me uh, right away. This one is QB 18. Uh, only other stat I think I could mention that you guys have in is since taking over as a starter in week six of 2019, he has the second most points among quarterbacks. Um, and so he's going behind guys who have a lot more risk uh, and a lot more and have not proven it. So, I have yet to hear a strong case as to why he's going at QB 18, but obviously there's a segment of the dynasty uh, crowd out there that is waiting and he's, he's falling in drafts and I'd be happy to take advantage of it. We all agreed except Don that Ryan Tannehill was the ride or die player, but Don went with a great young wide re- second year wide receiver, man. T Higgins. You can't go wrong. Let's jump to round seven. We start off with, Ooh, a little bit of controversy with James Robinson, followed by Kenny Galladay, Jalen Waddle, Noah Fant, Deontay Johnson, Miles Gaskin, Cooper Cup, Carson Wentz, Juju Smith-Schuster, DJ Chark, Julio Jones, and Cortland Sutton. Don, who do you have? Call me Homer all you want, but I'm going to go with Deontay Johnson here. I absolutely love everything he brings to the Steeler offense. The guy gets covered up in targets. Roethlisberger absolutely loves him. And with the dynamic uh, potential here, which Smith-Schuster and Claypool added to that offense, he gets to work out of the slot where he's an absolute technician and with a will be charitable kind of not-so-wonderful offensive line here. There's going to be a need to get the ball out early, and that favors the slot receivers, and that's Deontay's shtick. He's going to be open, going to be targeted continuously and can actually improve on the wide receiver 26 if he cleans up some of the drop issues that he had last year, which given his track record, we would expect that he would do that. I hope he does. I love Deontay Johnson. Now, if you can find it, you could do worse than having a designated Kenny G spot on your roster. After an injury-plagued year in the football hell called Detroit, sorry, Ryan, Uh, Kenny Galladay has moved to New York to fill the giant hole the team had at wide receiver. Now, he's a true number one receiver. Kenny showed what he could do in 2019, posting over 1,100 yards and 11 TDs for a terrible Lions team. Look for him to emerge as the main passing target for Daniel Jones, receiving easily over 140 targets this year. Remember, it's the volume of targets that matters. He's able to convert them, and he gets the high-value red zone targets because of his size. I'm going with Kenny G all day long. Kit, who is your ride or die? I went with Deontay Johnson as well. So just to add a couple of the specifics, uh, he was eighth in the league in targets at 144. Despite essentially playing 13 games, he had two games where he played less than 20% of the snaps and one game that he missed. Uh, from week seven on, he had 10 or more targets in eight of 11 games. Uh, again, I think to a, to Don's point that the high volume, quick passing attack is, is likely to continue. They brought in Najee with the idea that they would run the ball, but they also lost like two of their best offensive linemen on an already terrible offensive line. Uh, so I don't I don't see that changing. 
Uh, and again, not not very analytical, uh, but it's not, I'm not a homer, but I live here in Pittsburgh and I watch him. He just seems to have something, and he gets the ball with his quickness uh, that's just very impressive to me. So I'm all over Deontay. Looking forward to watching him uh, here for 17 games. All right, let's go to round eight. That starts off with Robert Woods, talked about a little bit earlier, followed by Matt Ryan, Tom Brady, Tyler Lockett, Kirk Cousins, Adam Thielen, Dallas Goddard, Trey Sermon, my guy, Ronald Jones, LaVisca Chenault, Daniel Jones, and Chase Edmonds. Kit, who are you picking out of that group? I'm taking Bobby Trees. Um, some of the reasons I uh, mentioned before about, uh, about how they expect that offense to improve. Um, but he's been top 14 wide receiver in PPR these three, uh, the last three years. He's not old at 29. Uh, he seems to have a skill set that I think will age well, you know, based on technique rather than really raw athleticism. I should have the best quarterback he's ever played with in his career. It was terrible in Buffalo, and uh, Jared Goff is, you can have different opinions, but he's worse than Stafford. Uh, and I think other people like Van Jefferson will take some of the vacated targets, but between Josh Reynolds and Gerald Everett leaving, there's 147 targets that are, that are open, and that's if they don't pass anymore. Uh, and then another nice little bonus about Robert Woods is since he's come to the Rams for three straight years, he gets between 100 and 150 rushing yards and a rushing TD or two. It's not that much, but it kind of sneakily, when you look at his receiving yards, you're like, how is this guy top 14? And he's getting the, you know, the extra 20, 30 points. Um, you know, the same offense happened for three years in a row. I don't see a reason to think it wouldn't continue uh, this year. I've got Tom Brady. I mean, who's going to slow this offense down? Not even father time can beat Tom Brady at this point. I don't care if he's 44. I trust at least two more top 10 seasons from Tom Brady. This season, he has Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, Antonio Brown, Gronk, O.J. Howard, and then amazing depth behind those five guys, Cameron Brait, Tyler Johnson, Jalen Darden, Scotty Miller. The only thing that can slow Tom Brady down this off this season is their defense. It's the only thing. I have Tom Brady statted out at leading the league and neck and neck with Patrick Mahomes with 5,200 passing yards. And I don't think that's absurd. It's about a, a 500, sorry, it's about a 310 passing yards per game pace. And I've also got him statted out for 42 touchdowns. And you know what he did last year and won fewer games? 4,633 and 40. He's got an extra game this year. How is he going to do worse than that year two in a Bruce Arians offense with a healthy wide receiving core? and hopefully a healthy O.J. Howard and a Gronk that's finally in NFL game shape. I understand he doesn't have the rushing upside, but I don't care. He's also going to turn the ball over a lot less than the guys that do have rushing upside. He's going to limit every negative aspect of his fantasy score. I'm not projecting him at something he can't do. I'm barely giving him any more touchdowns than he did last year. He's only gotten more familiar with this offense. I don't understand how the numbers don't go up. You know, uh, I am not somebody who generally will agree about Tom Brady being phenomenal as a Jets fan, of course. But Oh, I hate the guy as a person, but um, man, I want him for fantasy. And he did, I mean, I don't know if anybody saw the story today that supposedly he was playing on a partially torn MCL all last season. Now, of course, that's Brady saying that because nobody loves Brady more than Brady. Um, but sunscreen companies hate him. I don't understand that. Oh man. Uh, I'll gladly unwrap that. So, um, Tom Brady does not believe in sunscreen. He believes if you stay hydrated enough, you cannot get a sunburn amongst many other weird ass beliefs that Tom Brady has. We can spend a whole podcast just going over Tom Brady. Oh, I would love that. You know, just as a reminder to all the listeners out there, football players are generally dumb. Just because somebody's a great quarterback doesn't mean they have the slightest bit of actual intelligence. Um, ben Roethlisberger is a great example uh, of that. So remember that. Don. Yeah, as long as melanoma is a thing, make sure you wear your sunscreen. Uh, yes, please wear sunscreen. Please wear sunscreen. And you're right. When, Go ahead, when the goats competition in this bracket here is uh, what's left of Matt Ryan and a... a whatever Atlanta's offense is going to be. And then speculations with Daniel Jones and, and Mac, Mac Jones. 
with an ADP of 88, you got to look at the GOAT. But I'm going to go a different way. I'm going to take LaVisca Chenault, and as I generally try to avoid the clown fiesta that is the Jacksonville offense, the only nice thing that was ever said about a single wide receiver by that entire coaching staff was said about LaVisca Chenault. They like his talent, they like his ability, they like his size, which is something they don't seem to like about anybody else there, which translates to targets. And yeah, they're going to throw the ball. They absolutely will. You don't draft the 1-1 quarterback and a generational player and don't let him throw. I think the majority of those passes are going to head LaVisca's way, regardless of DJ Chark being hanging around. I think LaVisca's the one you want here. And yeah, they may not be any good at all, but Jacksonville's going to have to throw the ball and probably... The guy that's going to get the benefit of that is going to be LaVisca Chenault. Any worry about his downfield abilities? I don't have any real worries about his downfield abilities. I mean, that was something that was always talked about when they drafted him. And he was this hyper-athletic guy that was going to be your jump ball dude and was going to be able to go up and get that contested catch. That's something that Ohio State and Florida always valued very highly with their wide receivers was contested ball ability. And since we expect to see something similar – in terms of offensive scheme to those college programs, uh, he fits the mold. All right. So just to recap round eight, we had Kit going with Bobby Woods. Uh, Rob went with Tom. Terrific. No, he doesn't believe in sunscreen. Jesus Christ. Sorry. Sorry. I digress. And uh, Donnie went with uh, LaVisca Chenault. All right. Gentlemen, now that we all put on our positive pants, and now it's time for our game of. And I hate everything about you. Everything about you. That's right. That was some ugly kid Joe playing. These are the players that we hate everything about. We're going to go back through in a speed round format through Sleeper ADP for each round and tell you the player. We can't stand to be around the players we hate everything about. Let's start with round one. Kit, who do you have in round one that you do not like? So I'll qualify a little bit, but you can't really hate anyone in round run that, that much. Uh, but I don't like Alvin Kamara at his current ADP. Uh, I think uh, in the four games that Taysom started last year, he was on a 60 target, 40 catch pace. As we all know, he's gone for... 81, 81, 81, and 83 catches, which is really the, the backbone of why he's so, so prolific, uh, you know, as, as a running back. Um, you know, he has had TD success, right? And I do expect him to be on the higher end of that. But again, that's something that inherently does regress year to year, um, especially if you know, Taysom continues to get goal line touches. Maybe he's worked in more packages because he's kind of a, a bulldozer near the goal line. Uh, I still expect him to be good, right? But he's going to get ahead of guys who are 22 and has an unclear quarterback situation. Um, so I think, I think I drop him down, you know, six or seven running back spots. Maybe, maybe that's a lot, four or five running back spots. Um, and I don't want him in round one. That's for sure. That's interesting. And I know we received a lot of pushback, um, as a group, we didn't have Camara as high as we had in the past. There has to be concern about Taysom Hill, right? There has to be. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. There's at least a chance, right? And he's not, actually, he's not being discounted against it at all. It doesn't seem. I mean, I would put it at 50-50 that Taysom Hill ends up as the QB. Uh, does anybody think it's it's leaning more towards Winston? That The beat writers don't even know. Uh, yeah. I lean slightly Taysom. I think everyone wants Jameis Winston to win it, at least everyone in the fantasy circles, because it means so much more for everyone outside of Taysom Hill. But we have to come to the realization that Sean Payton loves Taysom Hill. Yep, exactly. Just like Pete Carroll and Chris Carson. Coaches have players that they love. Taysom Hill's the guy. For me, the player that I want nothing to do with this year. Mind you, I'm saying this year. Don't think he's going to have a great year. Is the 1-1, Trevor Lawrence. Now, I don't know how the next few years will be for him, but I don't trust Urban Meyer as his coach. He should be fine long term, but we have seen great QBs with bad coaches get wrecked. As a Jets fan, I've seen a lot of QBs get wrecked. So, granted, most of them weren't great, but 
I can't see a high-powered offense rolling out of Jacksonville this year. I have no faith in Urban Meyer, and I worry about somebody reaching for Trevor Lawrence at the end of round one and being so disappointed in what he actually is able to do in his rookie year. And I hope people don't hold that against him, but let's see how long he lasts with Urban Meyer. Does anybody have great feelings about Trevor Lawrence as a rookie? No, he would have been my sell. I don't think he finishes the best rookie quarterback this season. And it's exactly, you know, Urban Meyer, lack of rushing upside. I think he's absolutely a generational prospect, but this is not his year. All right, let's jump to round two. Uh, Rob, who did you have as the player you hate for this year? I don't hate him, but I don't want Russell Wilson on my fantasy team. He's inconsistent. He fades every year. Do we actually trust Pete Carroll to really let Wilson open up the offense this year? They say it every offseason, and I feel like it works a few games, and then Pete Carroll just feeds Chris Carson the ball. He wants to be a run-first offense. I don't care if they got the passing coordinator from the Rams to come over and open things up, add a lot of pre-snap reads in, or sorry, pre-snap motions in. It's not going to happen. He finished his quarterback six last year, and that was off of an electric start. He finished the season weak. The last nine games of the season, his best finish was top eight. He finished top 12 three times. I mean, six times he was not a QB one, and you're going to take him in the second round? His other six games were 19, 19, 21, 28, and 14. I don't want that on my team. That hurts you as you get ready for the playoffs. That will absolutely kick you out in the first round. No thank you, Russell Wilson. You know, I think a lot of times people look at the end-of-year numbers and extrapolate that they were evenly dispersed amongst the weeks of the season. But with Russell Wilson, you saw last year that he was front-loaded. He started off as the QB1 and was looking like he was going to run away with it. And he did the same then, thing in 2019, which is the frustrating thing. It's a pattern at this point. It really is a pattern. And he's somebody who can get you into the playoffs, but never seems to be around when you need him in the playoffs. I can't disagree with you on that one, Rob. Don, who do you have in round two? Somebody you do not want for this year. So my round two that I want no part of this year is I want no part of DeAndre Swift. I have zero faith in the Detroit offense as a whole. Yeah, the guy's going to catch a couple passes, but they're not going to go for anything. So he might get a catch for two or negative two. And it's all going to balance out because they have no way to stretch the field whatsoever. Don't give me the Quintus Cephas nonsense. You don't need to honor even that. You knew it was coming, didn't you? I knew didn't you? it was coming. You just like to say that name, <sighs> and no, it's not going to help. I love that in name. In any way. They go and get themselves a noodle arm quarterback at Jared Goff, and yeah, the dump-offs are going to be there, but I just don't see it. That offensive line wasn't good to begin with, has lost pieces. Yeah, they were replaced with some high-value draft picks and stuff, but boy, I just don't see it this year. So yeah, I want no part of DeAndre Swift because... I am selling all things Detroit this year because I just don't see them being viable. The only viable player they have is TJ Hawkinson, and you won't be able to change my mind on that. Well, I won't even try with that kind of attitude. Good. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's go to round three then. Kit. It's Kyle Pitts. I mean, I you know, I actually like Kyle Pitts as a prospect uh, overall. I think there's a good chance he's going to be successful, but it was baffling to me to see him going ahead of Darren Waller. Uh, and some of the trades you see posted on Reddit for him, it, it's just insane. I mean, lots of very, very good prospects don't meet their expectations. And that's like not being factored into his price at all. It's already basically assumed that he already hit, he's proven successful in the NFL, he won't have injury issues um, no matter what. And, and I agree, he has a high floor, but going in the third round of, of a startup, that feels insane to me. If I happened to get him, I would be shopping him because, again, like I said, there could be one or two fans out there that'll give you some ridiculous prices on him, get multiple first round picks and a, t a good tight end back or something crazy like that. Um, so really just selling him at that value uh, because I know that there are people out there who are valuing him this high. <laughs> you know, one of the weird things with the tiers is I ended up putting Kyle Pitts in tier one, not because of my assumed production from him, 
but because of his actual value right now. And you can get just as much for him as you can for Darren Waller. I mean, you could get more for Kyle Pitts than Darren Waller. And I don't know. I don't know. I just don't think Kyle Pitts is as revolutionary as everybody's saying he's going to be. There has been a ton of uber-athletic tight ends in this league who could catch, and it didn't necessarily work out as planned. So let us all remember. I think I might have been guilty of it too, but let's just pump the brakes a little bit on a rookie tight end setting the world on fire. Let us all remember Eric Ebron was a number seven pick overall. Listen, I remember it being between him and Jay Samaro for the Jets, and we took Jay Samaro. How did he turn out? Right? Everybody, yeah. Just be wary. Be wary of expecting instant gratification for him. Round four. Am I correct? Are we in round four already? No, I'm up. Round three still. You, oh, you're up, Rob. I'm sorry. Oof. Rob three, who do you who do you have in round three? This is the one I've been waiting to get off my chest for a while, but touching on, on Kyle Pitts real quick. He's the wide receiver two in Atlanta. And I think he's absolutely a fade because of that. Teams are going to put their jumbo quarter on him or their best coverage safety. And that's something he did not face in undergrad a lot. That's He's not been up a, against a whole lot of NFL corners or safeties. I would temper my expectations, but he's absolutely a weed. But my sell for round three is keeping it in the tight end position. And it's George Kittle. Sports entry predictor... Gave him an 89% chance of missing time this year with the injury. He missed eight games last year. He sprained his knee in the opener. He broke a foot and he broke a bone in his foot. And I'm a little scared. I'm a little scared. It seems like everyone in San Francisco has injury problems. I don't know if it's if they need to clean house. Maybe go hire Kyle. Hire Kyle as a as a therapist, but something's going on down there. Everyone seems to be injured, whether it's Jimmy Garoppolo, George Kittle, it doesn't matter. And I think this is the last year you can trade him as an elite tight end. If if he's injured this year, he will definitely take that injury-prone tag and carry it with him for the rest of his career. And there's question marks at quarterback. There's some develop. There's development at the wide receiver core with Ayuk and Debo. If he doesn't put up a top three season this year, he's my tight end six next year. I think Waller, Hawk, Pitts, Andrews, they all overtake him. And this is the highest you'll ever see him in a startup draft again. Wow, I couldn't disagree with you more about Kittle. I... I have learned by listening to our injury people over the years from Nick to Kyle to Eric to Matthew, uh, all the guys on Next Man Up, that there's no such thing as injury prone. He was injured, he's healthy, and I believe in George Kittle this year. I happily Let's sold say. him for TJ Hawkinson plus this offseason in one of my dynasty leagues, and I love it. I love it. I, I would say, yeah, Rob, at least make one point, you know, putting aside whether he's more likely to get injured or not. If he does miss four games this year, he's going to be, the perception is going to be there. The value would never be able to get what you get for him now. I definitely agree on that. Point. That is correct. I agree with you there. When he plays, he's the tight end three at, at worst. Maybe, I would rather take Waller if he picks later, but he misses so many games. So many games. He plays in a very violent manner. So I, I can see maybe that being a little bit sticky. All right, let's go to round four. Kit, who in round four do you not like? Josh Jacobs. Uh, I am out on Josh Jacobs, basically. And I, I think I've seen that that's gone maybe too far. I might even compared to other people not be out on Josh Jacobs. But in round four, I'm still not touching him. He wasn't very efficient last year. Um, they ended up cutting like two thirds and some of their be- or trading some of their best offensive linemen. Uh, he really finished where he did last year, which I believe was running back eight in standard because of a high TD rate. Uh, now they like to use him there, um, but they don't have the most prolific offense. So I wouldn't like expect him year, already, year over year to be a, a high touchdown guy. Uh, he came in and theoretically has pass catching skills, 
But for whatever reason, Gruden has no interest in using him that way. Uh, they brought in Drake now, who I think specifically is going to be used in those instances. So he had 29 catches last year. That seems like that's a close to a ceiling for him if the offense goes as I expect. Uh, and then he's tough, but he's been banged up. Missed games each of the past two years. Not major time, but seems like he always has some, some nagging injury. It's kind of kind of hanging out there. Um, so, yeah, I could see Josh Jacobs having a not particularly efficient year, finishing something like RB24, and really his star fading from the dynasty community's uh, overall impression. That's interesting. I, I think he's in one of the few situations, and only because Gruden's in a, what, 30-year contract or something ridiculous right. like that, <laughs> where – he is the bell cow, right? He's going to get the bulk of the carries. So that's the only reason I wouldn't fade him is because of his, his situation. So I would say I think he has a pretty high floor, right? And I, and I mean, maybe I said something like RB24. Maybe it's more like RB18 or 20, right? Um, but yeah, I also think that, I mean, they paid Drake significant money for a running back. Uh, I don't think that should be completely discounted. Yeah, start from the bottom. And Don, who do you have in round Four. Josh Jacobs is an interesting call here. I never trust Chucky when it comes to like doing what you think it ought to happen because it never happens that way ever. And they'll never be rid of him because they gave him part ownership. So he's there forever. The guy I absolutely want nothing to do with here is Miles Sanders. Uh, going with an ADP of 49. No, I'll wait a minute and I'll take Monty. I'll wait a minute and I'll take a better wide receiver or somebody who I know is going to produce because if Miles doesn't hit the home run, he's giving you nothing. He's absolute trek, and I'm sorry, I have no faith in the Eagle offense this year. People love Hurts. I'm, I love the the person. I don't necessarily love the quarterback that's going to be on the field, and I don't really have any faith in that offensive line. So when you put a, a running back in there that's already had problems and always seems to have these soft tissue things that indicate that he's not really handling his business the way he ought to in terms of his preseason prep. That just screams a lack of maturity on the player's standpoint and leads to a lack of longevity. And I want nothing to do with Miles Sanders this year. And although I just said the thing about not being, there's no such thing as injury prone. He's the kind of guy who might not miss games, but he misses quarters a lot. Where he gets a, an injury and then he's sitting for like the third before he recovers enough to come back in. And I definitely do not like miles sanders now round five i don't know if this could be the like the lowest hanging of fruit in this round um but the player i like the least for this year in this tier is deshaun watson i don't think he's playing this year so i don't know why he is going this high and i understand the thought that he is still young he's a great qb and he has a long career ahead of him but my question is, if he's suspended for the year, he's just coming back to Houston, where he doesn't want to be. So unless they trade him while he's suspended, is he just going to walk back and then hold out the following year? I don't want a player on my roster who, A, will give me zero value this year and could possibly miss games in a dispute with his franchise in the following year. So I'm sorry. I'm, I'm out on Deshaun Watson in round five. Have you seen that? Um, sorry to put you on the spot here, JJ. It came out yesterday that apparently the Eagles have inquired about Deshaun Watson. It makes me sad as a Jalen Hurts truther, but does that give you any thought to, to reconsider? I think no. actually the specifics of that were pretty weird. It was like Adam Schefter on a Philly radio show right. saying, he thinks they're in the best position to do that. And it was unprompted, so maybe it's based on something. I believe. But like, when I actually dug into the quote, it felt a little more ambiguous. They've got three yeah. first-rounders next year? Correct. Yes. They could do it. Right? So I think whole... that's what that was based off of, and not the fact that the Eagles have shared an interest in using those three picks to get to Sean Watson. So, and I still don't know how I would feel if he went to the Eagles with Howie Roseman. I mean, living in the Philly area, Howie Roseman is probably the most hated guy around. The worst GM in the league for the second worst GM in the league. Uh, there's, there's a few bad ones, but he is definitely, definitely up there. Anybody have anybody in round five they want to share? I saw yeah. it was alone. Yeah, Don, who no, do you No, I'll go with it. Uh, just on the Watson thing, though. I mean, it is 
with a team that has the potential to have three first round picks, we have to wait and see how much Carson Wentz plays to see if they get the one from Indy or not. Uh, it would be dereliction of duty on their part not to at least make a phone call and just see where they're at. It's still the, the whole point of you're holding a guy for at least a year because the league has made zero comment. And you know, the league has its own court and system about what's going to happen in terms of personal discipline for all this stuff, regardless of whatever happens in terms of real court. So we wait to see what that's going to be. But the person I want no part of is I want no part of Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper is the king of breaking your heart. He will show up for three games and God knows which three it is. But when he shows up, phenomenal. And then he goes to bed, has to recharge the batteries before he dumps them all in another game and then goes away again with the plethora of targets hanging out there in Dallas. And really, I think CeeDee Lamb is the one to have out of all of them. Cooper and his boomer bust style is just something that as a fantasy owner, I don't want anything to do with because one of the things I absolutely value with where I'm selecting players is consistency and he displays none. Amari Cooper reminds me of the old, uh, the old rhyme, he, the girl with the curl in the middle of her forehead. When he's good, he's really good, but when he's bad, he's horrid. Uh, that's Amari Cooper to me. It's Amari Cooper to me. He can have really amazing games and then just disappear, sort of like Mike Evans. Yeah, Mike Evans is that guy to me. Like at the end of the season, again. His overall number is huge, but you have those weeks where he just kills you. And you can't stand to have a guy one catch you in a week. I mean, that mm. torpedoes you. Yeah, that that kills your hope. All right, round six. I hate to do this. Don, I'm sorry. I'm going with Chase Claypool as the player I hate in round six. I mean, he is going ahead of his teammates, Deontay Johnson and Juju Smith. Why? Schuster, sorry, Juju Smith Schuster. I forgot the Schuster. I apologize to the Schuster and his family. Um, he had one wide receiver one week last year. 62% of his starts resulted in a wide receiver three or worse finish. Why is he going in round six? I mean, he had one wide receiver one week. Juju had three. Deontay had six. And they're both going below him. No, thank you. No, thank you. I have no faith in Chase Claypool. Plus, the way he wears his eye black looks like he's a <laughs> freaking idiot. So I don't trust him. I, I, I think he's trouble. I am out on Claypool. Those Notre Dame receivers, I don't trust them. They all wear the, the eye black like that. I feel like it's just a thing that's indoctrinated in me. Maybe there's nothing else to do in Indiana. Anybody else have somebody in round six or disagree with me about Chase? Don? Yeah, I got a guy for round six for you. Uh, while I'm not the biggest Chase fan here, I think the two to have are Deontay Johnson or in a contract year, Smith Schuster. Ben likes to get his guys paid, and he and Juju are tight, so I expect that Juju's definitely going to get the ball. He's also on this strange mission to prove that he can be an outside receiver. Well, we'll see how that all goes, whatever. Um yeah, I, that's still high for Chase in my in my estimation because it's going to be a three receiver offense for sure. So, yeah, I don't want him in this bracket. But the guy I want nothing to do with is Shaker and ba Baker Mayfield. That offense is predicated on running the football completely, and if it's not play action, it's not action. It's not going to work out. They've got Odell, the team wrecker, there hanging out, and I don't know what they're going to do with him. There's still talk of trade and or even possibly cut for him. There's once he's removed from the system, it's a whole lot of average on the outside there. And Austin Hooper's a nice tight end. But after that, he, he I mean, he's a nice tight end, but he's a true tight end. He's as good a blocker as anything else. So realistically, I want nothing to do with Baker. Yeah, he, he showed up for one playoff game and then run right back to Turtle. And I think that's where he's going to be. Until the stretch run at the end of the season last year, there was talk that they weren't even going to extend his fifth-year option. So... I'm sorry, I have no faith in Baker Mayfield. I'm actually excited if ODB, ODB, I always say ODB, sorry, OBJ leaves, um, that Donovan Peoples-Jones will, <laughs> the funk band himself, is going to get a shot. And I really like him on the outside. I was on a mission this, this summer to get as many shares 
of DPJ as I could. That was pretty successful, mostly for fourth round picks. But I was just gonna say, I'm uh, jealous. I, 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 uh, I agree with Baker. Just uh, the Baker take, just because what is the ceiling, right? Even if he doesn't, all the downside stuff, where okay, he looks bad, doesn't get extended or whatever. It, oh, you know, Beckham is still there. I mean, I think QB eighteen is where he finished each of the three years of his career. I can't see him going higher than fourteen or fifteen in that offense, even if everything breaks right. So it's like there's downside risk and nothing you're really shooting for there. Uh, let me go out with some other QBs up here. Yeah, if you're hoping yeah. for Kirk Cousins, look elsewhere. All right, let's look to round seven. Kit, in round seven, who do you hate? DJ Chark. I don't think he should be high here anymore. He still has some reminiscent hype, I guess, from because he is athletic uh, and big or skinny but tall. Uh, but I think he's the odd man out in the, in the receiving group. I think ETN's going to get scheme touches. They, like Don said earlier, you know, the one – positive thing they said about receivers and it seems to be a little bit of growing buzz from the the beat writers is that Sean Nault is pretty legit and the coaching staff likes him uh, and then Marvin Jones isn't going to stop being good Marvin Jones is going to get his you know he, he's going to be flying under the radar go for 70 catches and 940 yards or something like that and I just don't think the opportunity is going to be there for Chark and I don't think he's done enough with the opportunities had over the last two years to make you think that he's going to earn more um, and so I you know at that point I guess I'd say the next round he'd Robert Woods who I liked I'm way way up higher on Robert Woods than I am on someone like Chuck. I can't disagree with you. And the, uh, Myers is saying some weird things about DJ Chark and not being in shape and not playing well. Right. I don't know. He's just lobbing some grenades at him. I don't know if that's a motivational ploy, but I don't see DJ Chark sticking around too long with Urban Meyer. Anybody else have a round seven guy they are out on? All right, let's go to round eight and finish this off. Rob, do you have one for me? Yes. My round eight sell is Chase Edmonds. He's five foot nine. He's 209 pounds with four, five, five speed. He's a glorified three down back. And you're taking him in the eighth round where you need a guaranteed starter. Like, are you really taking him? Like, I'm, I'm not a Daniel Jones fan. Are you really taking Chase Edmonds? over a starting quarterback like Daniel Jones or Kirk Cousins or shoot Tom Brady, Matt Ryan going earlier in the round? Are you taking him over Robert Woods, Trey Sermon? I, I don't get it. I think James Conner eats into his workload. I don't think Arizona wants to use him as the primary back, which is why they brought in James Conner in the offseason. He finishes the RB56 his rookie season in 2019. He crept up to 25 in 2020 but the guy's got more than 10 carries three times in his entire career i don't want a guy who's going to give me eight to ten points a game in round eight i'd rather look for upside and i don't think he has any that's interesting um i like chase Edmonds. i don't know if i like him in the eighth round though and i i think that's the point you're making here there's a lot of players who I fall in love with because I was able to get them later in previous years. And now that they're going higher, I, I still have some of that residual affection towards them. And then you look and you're like, oh, I don't know how much, like, I don't know if I love you that much. That's a good call. Anybody else have anybody in round eight they are out on? Yeah. Round eight was hard for me. It's an interesting one because there's a whole lot of stuff going on, but, uh, I'll give you one, uh, Right around 93, it's 93.3 ADP, we got a guy in Ronald Jones that I don't get why people are taking him there. That backfield is a clouded mess. He cannot catch the ball. And if you just wait a little longer till 105 to 106, you get Michael Carter, Mike Davis, and Melvin Gordon, who all have better opportunities at better timeshares or better op better quality carries than Rojo is going to get. If anything we've ever seen here with Brady led offenses. It's that uh, the running back that's going to feast is the one that can catch the ball. If you want any of the three this year, it's probably Gio Bernard to take one of JJ's guys and friend of the show here. Santiago has been all over that. Uh, I have Gio as James white, the next here and the one to have of the three running backs Rojo here at this point. No, thank you. I want nothing to do with that. And again, speaking of that residual feeling, Rojo is somebody I took in one of my bigger uh, money leagues as a rookie. And he just so disappointed. And then I traded him and 
Like I, I don't. He's somebody who I don't have on any rosters. I'd rather. And I don't think I ever will. I'd rather Rojo than Chase Edmonds, but not by a huge margin. Yeah, I'd rather take the upside of Chase with his receiving. I like would Chase too. can be like Austin Eckler light. Rojo think, can be what Leonard Fournette light. See, I think Chase and Connor have an interesting little. Uh, back and forth here in the in the backfield there for Arizona, and I think they're going to complement each other very well. Whereas Rojo isn't as good as Leonard Fournette at the very thing he was brought in to do. It's just that Fournette isn't consistent with his health. So I don't know. I just don't like it. And you know, and as we always say to you, writers, pick the players you feel comfortable with. Pick the players in these rounds. And that's what this exercise was about, is looking at the rounds of ADP and saying, who do you think is going to perform for you this year? Who do you like the most? Because at the end of the day, if you draft players who you don't like and then they don't perform, you're not only going to hate the player more, you're going to hate yourself for taking them, right? I'd rather fail with a bunch of players I believed in than... Well, I won't say then succeed with players I don't. I, I'd rather succeed with players I don't believe in. But, I mean, let's be honest. But I'd rather fail with players I believed in than fail with players I didn't believe in. I already hate myself. I, I don't need to hate my fantasy team, too. Gotta, you got to take who you want. <laughs> Dude, you got to love yourself. If you don't love yourself, <laughs> nobody else can. Nobody else can, buddy. That, that, that's my dynasty tip of the pod. Love yourself. That way you're able to love others, too. But you don't have to love Chase Edmonds. You don't have to love Tom Brady either. He doesn't believe in sunscreen. Jesus. Do you know how many Irish people would be dead up in Boston if not for sunscreen? Like my entire wife's family. Half, like they bathe themselves in sunscreen and then go to the beach for 13 hours. Boston people are crazy people. All right, it is time for tags where we let the writers know where they can find us and any final thoughts. Rob, why don't you kick us off? You can find me on Reddit and on Twitter at the Roto Rob. Like everyone said, I mean, wear sunscreen. If you could see a live stream of what my face looks like, I'm the poster boy of a pale white kid who grew up in, in South Florida who just didn't wear sunscreen. My face should be on every sunscreen billboard. Like, if you don't wear me, this is what you will end up looking like. This is what you'll end up looking like. And um, I also thought we were going nine rounds here. Just to, to shout out who I teased earlier when I was talking David Montgomery. Really, really surprised me. David Montgomery, third highest juke rate in the league. Second was Antonio Gibson. First was who I wanted to go with in round nine, and it's Mike Davis. Mike Davis. I love that guy in Atlanta this year, and he's being slept on. I don't know if he can stay healthy, handle a massive workload, but even in limited touches, the guy can be electric. I'm a fan of Mike Davis. I was a fan when he went to Carolina. I actually thought that it would give them finally the opportunity to give CMC some rest. Little did we know CMC got a lot of rest, and Mike Davis was the lead back. I'm hoping to see what he can do in Atlanta this year and that he is successful. I've spent... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Go ahead. I've, I've spent the entire summer beating the drum for people that end up in, in Carolina or leave Carolina. I feel like it started with Terrace Marshall, and then I realized <laughs> that Mike Davis was just an awesome running back a year too late, and now I'm just beating the drum for, for that guy. I wish I would have caught it last year. Kit, tags. Hey, you can find me at, uh, on Twitter at kitv underscore dynasty ff uh, on Reddit at kitkit123. Kit uh, can't think of any parting wisdom. I think you guys got that covered so far. Wear sunscreen. There you go. Or Where's... just hydrate a lot. You know. <laughs> you should do both. You should hydrate <laughs> right. and it wear is. sunscreen. It doesn't hurt to hydrate. But egg, also do exactly. Both. Final thoughts, Don. Guys, you can find me at Rider Dynasty. Anything you send will get back to me. Look, folks, let's not get too fired up about rookies yet because pads haven't even shown up yet. Wait till pads come on and then check your beat writers because they're going to have the inside on who's actually looking good because so many camps are going to be closed. So many camps are not going to be on their off-site locations and there'll be limited fan availability for a lot of it. So you won't be able to get eyes on the prize yourselves. So definitely check the beat writers and realistically put it off as long as you can and wait till the pads come out because that's really the indicator. These guys can look great in shorts and they ought to. 
They ought to be able to complete passes against air. They ought to be able to catch against nothing. And if they can't, that's a real red flag. But check the beat writers. The real intel is coming. Thanks, Don. I'm at JJ Wenner on Twitter. Uh, thank you, Don, Kit, and Rob for coming on the pod with us. I want to give a special shout out uh, to Blair Perot. Uh, he's one of our fellow writers, potters over at Rider Dynasty. He is stepping down from the pod. Uh, life came at him fast and, you know, you have to do what is best for yourself and your family. But I just want to say thank you to him for, you know, being with us for the past year and a half and for helping us grow. So Blair, thank you so much. Remember the door is always open. Once you're part of the family, you're always part of the family. So from all of us to all of you, be safe, be well, and remember, never say anything to make a meeting longer or cut a happy hour short. Boat drinks, my friends. Boat drinks. Oh,